Welcome to Conversations. I'm Mukhtar Dar Khan, your host. And as you can see, I have with me a distinguished diplomat, uh, Talmiz Ahmed Sahab, who is now also a professor at Symbiosis University in Pune. And he has been writing on the Middle East crisis. Uh, and he has been ambassador to two of the more critical countries, both Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, who, who are key to this uh, so-called Abrahamic Accords, which both Donald Trump and Joe Biden have been pushing so aggressively, so much so that while Israel was busy trying to destroy its own democracy under Netanyahu's government, Joe Biden was substituting for the Israeli foreign minister by sending Blinken and then Jake Sullivan to Saudi Arabia to try and convince uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who is also the prime minister of Saudi Arabia, to move ahead on the Abrahamic Accords. So today we are going to talk about three, four key things, the future of IMEC, the India, Middle East, uh, Europe uh, economic corridor. And I also want to get some sense about the purpose of the Abrahamic Accords and then perhaps talk about the Cairo summit. So, but before I uh, invite uh, Talmiz Ahmed Saab to start giving us his thoughts, uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, please subscribe to Conversations, like the video, make sure that you share it with your friends and social network. And if you like to support conversations, do join. Uh, the button to join is right next to the button to subscribe. So tell me, Sahab, welcome to conversations. And thank you once again for joining. My first question you, is, man. does this, this horrible war, I mean, what Hamas did was absolutely inhuman. And what Israel is doing in response is stunning. I mean, already the, the casualties of civilians has exceeded 5,000. Uh, and they say half of them are children. The amount of emotions and anger and, and trauma that this war is causing to everybody here in America, in Israel, to Israel supporters, to Palestinians, to Muslims and Arabs all over the world is unimaginable. So given this context, do you see any future possibility of this IMEC uh, corridor uh, being realized, which was announced with so much fanfare by Prime Minister Modi and President Joe Biden. First, very quickly, where, what is quote-unquote shocking about the present event is that for the first time, Israel has been attacked on the scale that has occurred just now. Yes. But as far as the Palestinians are concerned, it has been their routine experience for more than 20 years. Do recall here that the Israelis have been assaulting the Palestinians with total impunity and killing thousands of them, including several thousand women and children. And it has just been a figure as far as the Western media and policymakers were concerned. Now, suddenly, when the same thing has been meted out to the Israelis, it has become shocking for everybody. But do recall what the Israelis did when they attacked Gaza in 2014. They just went in a few kilometers, killed 2,000 Palestinians, including 500 children in that short incursion. Yeah. So I must first set the record straight that if you have any tears, yes, do shed them, but shed them for the extraordinary tragedy that has been meted out to the Palestinian people. Now your question about this Fortunately, absolutely no. ridiculous project, the so-called um, I just the want so to interject. The uh, corridor. Uh, one of the battles that we fight here in the West is is trying to argue that even Palestinians are human beings, uh, and uh, the unfortunately our leaders and our media does not recognize the equal morality and equal humanity of Palestinians. So go ahead, sir, with IMEC. Yes, I thank you for this clarification. Uh, I think that may be changing. What you have since uh, uh, 1967 and consolidated after the end of the Cold War is a grip that the pro-Israel lobby has on the U.S. political and media establishment. It is a grip that has made the Israel a domestic issue as far as United States is concerned, not a foreign policy issue. And it is today impossible for any political leader any media writer, any commentator, uh, public commentator, 
to make a statement that would be sharply critical of the Israelis. And immediately he would be dubbed anti-Semitic. The two presidents that you had who took a tougher line as far as Israel is concerned, Jimmy Carter and George Bush Sr., both of them had curiously just one term. Yeah. Uh, anyway, let us leave this aside for now. You asked me about the so-called India, Middle East, Merid uh, Mediterranean, Europe corridor. It is an absolutely bogus concept. It serves no useful purpose. It is a desperate initiative on the part of the Americans to pretend that they matter in this region. They are actually rattled by the initiative taken by China to bring Iran and Saudi Arabia together. Since then, you have been seeing American diplomats scurrying around the region, trying to show that they have something to offer the region. Frankly speaking, the region has moved on. The, as I have seen major countries in West Asia uh, overwhelmingly asserting strategic autonomy, not wanting to be part of any US-led strategic alliance, and very strongly asserting their right to engage with Russia and China and pursue foreign policy on the basis of their own interests. This is very clear. Now, what about this so-called corridor? It makes no sense to me. Asia is already very well connected with the Arabian Peninsula. It is connected for several decades. Indeed, some of the major trade partnerships that Asian countries have with the countries of the Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula have been in place for at least two decades of, if not longer. India and major, major countries like China and India are already major consumers of the oil that this region produces, and we have a very solid uh, communications network in place. Coming to the Red Sea, we have been very, uh, we have the Red Sea as a crucial link between Asia and the Mediterranean, between the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean. And you have, we have been using that for our trade connection uh, uh, with the European countries for very long. And there is nothing that I see this corridor brings to the table. There is some talk about enhancing the railway network in the Arabian Peninsula. This is a project that goes back over 20 years. In some areas, it is making progress, but it doesn't need this, uh, this corridor initiative to push it forward. This is an initiative of the Gulf countries, and they will see it through on their own. The most striking aspect of this measure, of this initiative, is to somehow bring Israel into the network. Yeah. Israel is not part of the regional network as of now. Israel is an outsider. It has had a normalization relationship with the UAE and Bahrain for about three years now. That is it. It has a very long way to go be before it can acquire credibility in this region. What we saw from the American side a desperate attempt to bring Israel and Saudi Arabia uh, into a close uh, connectivity. That has now, I think, fallen apart. I don't think there was much enthusiasm for it anyway. All the other connectivities that we need are already in place. It also appeared to be a very crude attempt at somehow competing with the Belt and Road Initiative. Do recall here, the Belt and Road Initiative has been in place for already 10 years. It has made steady progress. There is, uh, they, they have learned certain lessons wherever they made mistakes. They have been corrected. More than 120 countries are part of it. Every country of the Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula is an integral part of the Belt and Road Initiative and a, and a very enthusiastic participant. My own impression is that because of the uh, Gaza war now, I don't think we will hear about this corridor for some time at least. I mean, the, I, when I looked at it the first time, to me, it appeared that for India, there was no additional advantage because the connection with India is by sea, which already exists. We are not building a new sea <laughs> to, for, the, for the IMAC thing. Absolutely but, correct. Yeah. I agree with you. And so the only thing that 
appeared was that uh, Mr. Biden, for example, I actually did a show in which I called Biden uh, Begani Shadi Me Abdullah Diwana because why was he co chairing a, a project where the US has no role in it? right? It is India, the Middle East, and Europe and Israel, but nothing. So he was there like an agent, like a publicity manager for Israel. So it appeared that the, the key thing for Biden was this railway connection between Saudi Arabia and Israel. That was the only key driver of his role. Uh, these Abrahamic accords, I mean, you have you're familiar with both the countries uh, which are critical to this. I mean, Bahrain and Morocco uh, are... Uh, I'm not sure are that critical, even though one of my friends from, who is in the Foreign Service in Morocco wrote me a long email saying that uh, because of the Abrahamic Accords, there are lots of Moroccan Jews who are very high up in the government in Israel, and it gives Morocco some access so they can talk to the Israeli government. Well, I, have, I haven't seen them achieve anything in the last 18 days in this crisis. So I don't know how the Abrahamic Accord is benefiting uh, the Palestinians or the Moroccans. But with UAE and Saudi Arabia, I have students from these countries in my class. And when I ask them about the Abrahamic Accord, they just go, Pop! they don't open their mouth at all. They have nothing to say as if my, my classroom is bugged. So I do point out this to my other students. I said, look, in Israel, we have a democracy. We can get a public opinion poll. But in UAE and Saudi Arabia, we have no idea where the public is on the Abrahamic Accords. My, uh, first, I must make one point clear. I detest the term Abrahamic Accord. This is the term concocted by Donald Trump in a fit of misplaced enthusiasm yeah. when he was staring at electoral defeat. I don't understand why you should bring the Old Testament prophet into an arrangement that is obviously opportunistic and seriously time-bound. Okay, the UAE. The UAE is a very small country. In its own country, it has about a million people. That is, it's about 10 to 12 percent of its own population. Foreign policy and foreign affairs are driven from the top. There is no public discussion or debate on any of these issues. It is given down, top down, and it is given to you as received wisdom. I personally would not be surprised if the uh, if the uh, normalization is uh, controversial in certain quarters. There is certainly at the popular level all across West Asia a very strong sense of support and indeed kinship with the Palestinian cause with Palestinian aspirations and with Palestinian interests. But it is something, as I said, that is top down. The UAE assessment at that time was very simple, that let us back these two people facing elections. If they win, good for us. Even if they lose, the Israel lobby will feel happy with us and we will carry on a relationship. But I do not attach any strategic significance to this achievement. And there is nothing. As far as economic cooperation is concerned, it has already been ongoing for a long time. Very large number of professionally qualified Israelis have other passports and they can travel back and forth as they wish. So I think that there should not be any, uh, any unique uh, political value attached to this accord. Coming to Bahrain, I think it is too small a country to be talking about any further. <laughs> Morocco, yes, they have a Moroccan uh, uh, Jewish population and Morocco has built up its own uh, uh, tradition and many of the edifices connected with the Jewish uh, community have been now uh, uh, have been upgraded, renovated and there is a flow of uh, Jews coming into Morocco. It's a very, very old community. Indeed, this reminds me that at a time when the Jewish community in the diaspora was suffering extraordinary privation and indignity, humiliation and even violence, pogrom and the culmination of this in the Holocaust, it is the Muslim empires and kingdoms that protected the Jewish tradition, protected the Jewish communities and gave them the space and opportunity to build up their own religious traditions and their culture. The connection that the 
Jewish community has with Morocco exemplifies this very rich history. But it has no significance. We know and it has been already reported that at the popular level in Morocco, uh, there is very strong opposition to the normalization. And indeed, because of that, there is no exchange of ambassadors so far. The last is Sudan. Now, I mean, if it was not so tragic, it would be a comedy. The Americans desperately wanted Sudan on board. They, uh, they, they went along with the destruction of the democratic order. They had promised the Sudanese government $1 billion in development assistance that they then stopped. And finally, Sudan is now in the throes of a civil conflict with two generals, both of whom supported the uh, mm -hmm. accord, uh, the normalization, now fighting with each other. How much lower can American diplomacy go in support of Israel's interest at a time when Israel was doing nothing in order to promote its interest in the region? They have an extreme right-wing government and consistently they have been doing things that would provoke the uh, they would provoke the Arab people and the Muslim community at large. What have we seen? We have seen over the last several months uh, uh, actual abuse of the Palestinian community in the West Bank, and uh, we have seen large number more than two hundred have been killed just in this year. And of course, after the conflict began, another hundred have been added to the list. Actually, sir, Many killed in, by the settlers. In West Bank, more people have been killed this year. And you have to go as far back as 2005 to get that. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. So that is the West Bank. And then the desecration, the deliberate and self-conscious desecration of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, which, which leader will have the courage to go forward? We had during the same period in the media certain reports that Saudi Arabia was looking at normalization. We never got any hard information about how far it was going. Only in one interview, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman spoke of uh, every day there is new progress. The issues that the Saudis had raised had nothing to do with Israel or the Palestinians. They were all aimed at enhancing Saudi capabilities in the region, connected with getting the most enhanced weaponry, obtaining a security guarantee, and having access to a civilian nuclear program. That was all. And I think that they were, uh, they, it was controversial within the, uh, within the United States. Large sections of American opinion were opposed to it. But the desperate desire of the Biden administration to somehow bring Saudi Arabia on board for this normalization project encouraged them to, re to leak reports that they were getting there. There was at that time a very certain, very strange references as far as the Palestinian interests were concerned. Many of them said the Saudis are not interested in the Palestinian interests. Certain others said that we'll do something formally, but not really mean it. And then there were reports from Israel saying Netanyahu, given his right wing associate, does not want even pro forma positive references to the Palestinian cause and interest. We were left somewhere at that point. We didn't know where things were going. Uh, my own assessment at that time was that Saudi Arabia did not have any uh, uh, any uh, reliable, uh, any uh, reliance on the so-called uh, security guarantee. All of us know that the Americans don't fight other people's battles and they were, there was the credibility as far as supporting allies is concerned is quite low. I think what the Saudis wanted was access to state-of-the-art weaponry, capacity to build some of that at home. What I understand and which has not come out in the media is that the Saudis wanted to develop their own defense industry and they were insisting on transfer of technology, which was proving a sticking point. The other was the civilian nuclear program. Everybody knows the civilian nuclear program in many countries could be the first step towards developing weapons capability. So all of this was still very controversial and at a nascent stage when the conflict began. 
And there you have seen very clearly the Saudis have backed off. There is no discussion of any uh, of uh, this so-called normalization. And uh, I think that that the Palestinian issue, which the countries were seeking to uh, to to ignore, is now once again at the heart of regional affairs. So one one interesting development, which has surprisingly not received so much attention, uh, is that three or four days before uh, Hamas uh, so brutally attacked Israel, uh, twenty Democratic senators wrote, wrote a letter to Biden saying that they would not support a treaty between Saudi Arabia, the Abrahamic Accords treaty, with the U.S. guaranteeing security for. So it will have to be a treaty. Because at least I'm sure that somebody in Saudi Arabia has even little brains to understand that the JCPOA kind of executive agreement yeah. will be reversed. Okay, Trump. Uh, you know, yes. So if the Saudis are going to take uh, a, yes. a, a executive order from Biden, I won't be surprised that Biden himself might reverse it before the election. I, I, I agree with you. I read about that uh, letter. Yeah. And it was also pointed out that Biden's support base in the Senate is so fragile that he needs these 20 senators to approve you know, the he agreement that 20. he has with the Saudis. He will have to get Republican votes in order to pass that. But with 20... Yeah. It's, and, it's and, like, and, may I ask you how many Republicans are going to vote for uh, the president's initiative? Uh, no, no, and no. Looking at how they withdrew from the right. JCPOA. So I think that this was thoroughly yeah. misguided. And, uh, well, anyway, I think what uh, Stephen Bolt has said in his article is that, really speaking, uh, the Saudi interest was in that, uh, in the agreement, in the defense agreement, three points of the defense agreement, normalization with Israel was thrown in as a sweetener in order to obtain congressional support. Anyway, this is now of historic interest, very much on the back burner, I'm not sure it's going to be resurrected for some time. I have a, uh, 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 we seem to be running out of time very fast, but I have this discussion. I'm sure you saw the the waste of time that the Cairo summit was uh, with about 25 countries participating. Nothing came out of it. Uh, I mean, there are little, little tiny things. The fact that the Italian prime minister went first to the Arab world and then to Israel. Uh, not many people are noticing the significance and symbolism that the distance between Europe and the U.S. has already started increasing. I did speak to a very prominent uh, European intellectual two days ago, and he made it very clear that there's going to be no financial or military support for Israel from uh, from Europe unless Iran attacks them. Uh, and, and in that remote scenario, but I, I wanted to talk about India. You know, there has been so much talk of India as uh, the voice of the global south. Uh, I actually wrote an article for the diplomat making the point that there is nothing south of Palestine in the global south. This is the most southern aspect of the global south. And yes, uh, lately, Prime Minister Modi himself has made an Indian spokesperson Arindam Bhakchi has also made uh, reaffirmed India's support for the two-state solution. But the failure of the Cairo summit, doesn't that give India an opportunity to open up another alternative uh, diplomatic initiative, a, a Delhi discussion to bring both Israel as well as the Arabs? The reason why Cairo summit failed is because both US and Israel were not there. So they, they couldn't have a meaningful dialogue. But India now, because it's part of the Quad, it is part of the I2U2, couldn't it actually take this chance of hosting an event where it brings, say, a smaller number of countries, Saudi Arabia, uh, US, Israel, uh, and maybe Egypt, uh, with, with whom India has great relations together to Delhi to have a serious discussion about uh, the future of this region. Sometimes conferences take place for the pomp and pageantry and because there is a, simply a gathering. Nobody expects that they are going to go anywhere. It's like the Security Council meetings. Yeah. You are never, you're going to have the meeting, you're going to have a resolution, but no resolution is ever going to pass. As far as Israel is concerned, it is a law unto itself. It is. It knows full well that the Americans will support it. Whatever it wishes to do, 
and whatever the nature of the government in Tel Aviv. You remember that Biden uh, disliked Netanyahu and did not talk to him for two and a half years. And now suddenly he's all over the place, he hugging and kissing and saying that I am, I am with you and you have my total support. It's an embarrassment what is happening. Biden actually referred to this government as the most extreme Israeli government. He used those words, Biden. Absolutely. Yeah, he used that word earlier. Yeah. And then he also counseled Netanyahu not to pursue those judicial yeah. reforms because yeah. they were undermining the country's democracy. And Netanyahu, more or less, he went to Russia. He whacked his bags and went to Russia and cocked a snook at the American president. And here is the American president rushing to him giving him total carte blanche, not willing to use the word ceasefire, not willing to use the word de-escalation. It yeah. is an embarrassment and I think this is a low point in American diplomacy. Now coming to India, I must tell you uh, with deepest sorrow, India has no interest whatsoever in serious foreign policy issues. Our priority and is at home. Our priority is to redo the idea of India and to create a new idea of India founded on the ideological basis, founded on the basis that is the ideology of our government, of our governing leadership. Let us not be very, let us be very clear about this. You will see that you are talking about convening this meeting, convening that meeting or putting this initiative or that initiative together. None of that has any resonance in India whatsoever. I don't believe there is any future on that. And therefore, India is not interested. Our approach with all the nations in our neighborhood are uh, bilateral. I mean, in West Asia, they are bilateral. They are also corporatized. What we have done is corporatized our foreign policy in the sense that the political initiatives are meant to open the doors for the corporate sector. That is true not only on bilateral basis, but even the so-called I2U2 has exactly the same content, corporate interest. So I don't think that you should seek at this stage from India a serious foreign policy initiative. In any case, and to close this chapter once and for all, the leadership in India has a very strong emotional bond uh, with Prime Minister Netanyahu personally and with Zionism on an ideological basis. All the rest that you saw coming from India, the statement relating to the two-state solution is for the record. It is a mantra that is recited mindlessly with no serious interest or conviction. Sir, uh, uh, what, what do you think is, is, I mean, I know, I mean, I'm, I'm asking a very difficult question, but uh, do you think that the Palestinian cause and the, the prospects for a Palestinian state are over and, and there is a fatigue in the Arab world? And so they want this mess, this whole issue to go aside so that they can now work on their GDP and their economic growth uh, and their uh, insecurities with, with regards to Iran. And is Iran's foreign policy one of the reasons why there is no progress uh, in in this arena that Arab countries scared of Iran uh, have been running towards these Abrahamic Accords. So Iran, by forcing the Arabs to be afraid of Iran, uh, have led to the abandonment of the Palestinian cause by Saudi Arabia and Egypt and others. I don't buy any of this analysis. As far as the Palestinian cause and interests are concerned, there is extraordinary support right across the Arab world and indeed overwhelmingly all across the so-called global south. Let us be at the popular level. Most governments also support these aspirations but are not able to carry any authority or clout. Why? Because Israel has made it very clear, no one counts as far as they are concerned, except for the Americans. And we know, at least for the last 40 years, they have the Americans where they want them. No American president will, will ever say anything that the, that the ruling government, the government of the day, doesn't want to hear. You have seen the spectacle of President Biden, a serious embarrassment. I felt sorry for the president that he has views, he has concerns, he has legitimate concerns. 
he has counseled patience to the prime minister prime minister netanyahu he has reminded him of the american mistakes after 9/11 he has repeatedly said do not act in rage because the consequences may be worse than what you uh, what you had started with but he refuses to use the word cease fire refuses to use the word de escalation refuses to use the to call for peace which is why you have a mutiny within the state department against this kind of policy and did you notice another thing a very strange thing israel could fight for just one day on its own the second day onward american military supplies had to reach immediately the world's great army could not fight for one day against a ragtag group of a few thousand militants and such massive military supplies had to be airlifted to the israelis i mean i am seriously concerned i believe that we've been victims of a hoax all about the israeli army they haven't fought for 50 years with another army what have they done in the last few years they have killed several thousand people in the entire neighborhood none of them has an army none of them has an air force none of them has a navy they are militants some of them they get hit from the air and several hundred of them are killed women and children look at the numbers a staggering number and this is the great army they couldn't fight for a day and of course the americans have come and said please take this equipment and we will give you this we will give you and of course they have also moved uh, two aircraft carrier uh, groups into the east mediterranean to ensure no one else now enters the conflict and israel has a free hand in gaza this is a travesty and i think as i said earlier this is a low point as far as american diplomacy is concerned and i think they have lost their credibility if they wanted to win over arab states and other states to their so called alliance the alliance of democracies as uh, mr biden laughingly refers to his coalition there would have been a more even handed approach but none of that is evident at all to us at this stage yeah. and this whole business of seeing a connection between the gaza war and the war in ukraine and calling for the coming together of a western coalition to save values and save western interests is i think absolutely bogus nobody buys this argument at all i'm sure even the american people do. no he's he's uh, i was looking at polls by cnn and cbs only a minority of americans support what biden is doing uh, and it is only a, uh, even in even in the democratic party the support for what biden is doing is not significant uh, it, it seems that biden is on his own with blinken on this even the state department as you pointed out uh, there is an internal uh, kind of upheaval uh, they have something called the dissent channel on which more and more uh, state department people are voicing their pro- protest one gentleman called paul josh uh, resigned from his job Uh, at uh, the irregularities with which the US has violated its own laws in transferring weapons to Israel and uh, what is interesting is uh, that uh, that now Biden also wants 14 billion dollars for Israel i find that very stunning that the world's the most powerful country in the middle east Uh, you know all, what this is all about it's yeah. all about electoral politics yes exactly it's a, about a, a leader politics. facing elections a year later Yep. doesn't want to be outdone by the republican but i will honestly say to you i don't think any of this is going to help no this is but not. a free it's ride true. as far as israel is concerned you know they've already killed 5000 people including 1500 children and 5000 uh, five and 500 women already yeah they are going you know if you see the graph every day a few hundred numbers are added uh, to their graph but there is no no talk about it no mention of this at all do we not have women and children in among the palestinian camp do we not have them uh, they are also families they also are tormented they also seek food and shelter and fuel and electricity what is this collective punishment that you have given to an entire and you know what is the size of those people 2.3 million 2.3 million americans themselves have noted that it is an open air prison and yeah. uh, and a jewish scholar referred to it as the largest concentration camp he has ever seen 
But this is a scenario, a you total know, moral bankruptcy of American diplomacy. You know, one of the most interesting things is that America is significantly divided. Everybody above 65 is with Biden uh, and everybody below 35 is against Biden. And I'm willing to bet that Biden is going to pay a very heavy price in November on this. Whatever chance he had of winning the elections, this this war, he has lost a lot of votes uh, from progressive Democrats, from social justice Democrats, uh, from v various other brown communities in the United States. Even the Indian community, there is a very small friends of uh, of BJP who might give money and votes to him, but the broader Indian community is also not with him. Uh, Ambassador uh, Talmiz Ahmed Saab, I am extremely grateful for you for coming and speaking so frankly and candidly. It's very important for Americans to listen to, uh, I mean, go beyond their bl blind spots and listen to, to somebody like you who knows the region very well, understands U.S. foreign policy and understands uh, global geopolitics so well. So I'm extremely grateful for you. For Professor Khan, may I make one very small point referring please, to please. something that you had said? Please. You have talked about the Arabs not supporting uh, Arab states and Arab governments moving away from the Palestinian cause. That may indeed be the case. And there may be certain countries which are uh, uh, there that may be wanting to have a different foreign policy and uh, much more uh, connected with reaching out to Israel and appeasing the Americans. But their own populations do not allow them. And that is the key. Even if they wish to go far away, their own populations are so sensitive on the subject, which is why you found your class, your students not willing to speak on the subject. Because if they had believed in what has been done, the so-called normalization, they would have spoken up. But I don't, I don't blame them. I don't blame them. We are all familiar with the political order uh, from which they have emerged. And that is not our business to make any remarks about the domestic scenario. That is theirs. But I want to make one last point to you. The Palestinian issue is with us from 1948. Look at the sufferings inflicted upon the Palestinian people. Continuously, uh, there have been extraordinary violence. They have suffered a siege. They have suffered bombardment. They have suffered killings. They have even suffered betrayals from some of their Arab uh, friends from time to time. But have they ever given up? This is curious that in my book, West Asia at War, I have referred to the, the subtitle says, Repression, Resistance and Great Power Games. Look at the continuum relating to resistance. The Palestinian cause is a continuous statement of resistance and it has never given up. And that look at the firepower inflicted upon them. They may even take a bullet on their chest. They may say that I don't mind this bullet because my life is so thoroughly hopeless. But they will pick up a stone if they can. But they will never give up. This is what the Israelis want. This is what the Americans hope for. And that is what some regimes may wish. But it is not happening. It is not happening whatsoever. And this is something we have to note with a degree of awe, a degree of pride and a degree of happiness. They pay a very heavy price. When the Americans talk of freedom and they say, we are free. Let them fight for the freedom of these beleaguered people. And then we will see, the, with, we will then, when the Jew and the Arab live together in a shared land that God has endowed to them, that is what we will call the Abraham Accord. Not these other opportunistic arrangements that we have seen over the last few years. Well, that is, I mean, on that profound note, uh, thank you very much. And for those of you who have watched uh, this this kind of discussion, you're not going to find anywhere else uh, on television or on YouTube channels. Uh, I'm extremely grateful for the ambassador to, who spoke so candidly. Uh, so those of you who have not yet subscribed to Conversations, please subscribe to Conversations, uh, like the video, share it with your social network. And Ambassador Saab, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. All good wishes to you.